Cine is proud to recognize the excellence of the following production by presenting it with the Golden Eagle Award and hereby certifies it to represent the United States of America in film and video festivals around the world. burning flesh was everywhere. Uh, death was a daily occurrence. People should listen. Please listen to us. Listen what we have to say. Listen for your own sake, for your children and the whole world. Listen to the six million which are not here. Please listen. We kept together because we knew if we don't keep together, we would perish much easier. Hello, I'm Rich Newberg at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. Imagine being crammed into a rail car like this one. There are so many people inside, you can't move, you can't sit. There are no toilets, just a bucket. You'll travel for days without food or water, uncertain of what awaits you at the end of the line. For almost all children under the age of 15 or 16, the end of the line at Auschwitz meant death. 89 teenage boys made this journey. Their destination was Birkenau, the main killing facility at Auschwitz. But instead of meeting their death, this group, the Birkenau boys, as they now call themselves, this group was spared. Each was hand-selected by Dr. Joseph Mengele, the notorious Nazi doctor of death. Each was selected to live while their families were gassed and burned. No one knows why. In June 1994, the Birkenau boys gathered to retrace their steps back to the very death camp that robbed them of their families and their childhood. I was privileged to go with them. This is their story. All they ask of you is that you listen. For American children in the 1940s, there would be hope for a secure future. But for most Jewish children and their families living in Europe, there was to be no future. How could they, or anyone, imagine the fate that awaited them? Adolf Hitler's master plan for Germany had no room for the Jewish people. His final solution would be to create factories of death to systematically murder the Jews of Europe, at least six million mothers and fathers and children, whose only crime was that they were Jewish. Only after the war would the world see the results of what Elie Wiesel later named the Holocaust. Six million Jews and five million others, including gypsies, homosexuals, and those with disabilities, slaughtered in a planned mass murder like no other in history. Children under the age of 15 were seldom spared because they were of no use to the Third Reich. Of the few spared, some were used in the perverted experiments of Dr. Joseph Mengele at the Auschwitz concentration camp. After the experiments, most were gassed. But for some unknown reason, 89 children were hand-selected by Dr. Mengele, the so-called angel of death, to live. And this is their story. The reason why they were chosen to be spared is a mystery. Their smiles do not reveal the pain of a horror they shared in common, but they do reflect the joy of seeing one another again 
meeting in Prague 50 years after the nightmare that left most of them without families. We, all of us, feel like brothers, first of all, because we had a common past. We lost our parents, we lost our siblings in a period when we needed them most. And this was, in my opinion, really sort of psychosurgery of life. Our life has been, in a sense, amputated. And uh, we had to cope with it in a very young age. They were among the children whose families were forced to move into a walled city near Prague, known as Theresienstadt. It was terribly crowded, and there wasn't enough food. Old and frail people would die in the streets. It was our, our normal life to see the corpses, the hunger, and uh, especially the, the, the misery of the, of the old people. People like the grandmother of Helmut Spritzer, who had to live in this flea-ridden attic with about 30 other people. It was so hot, you can imagine, under the attic. The fleas were jumping about like hell. It was exactly how people lived here. Old people, yes. helpless people, yes, yes, blind yes. people, yes, yes. sick people, yes. dying people with children and on, on the valises, on all their belongings and yes. uh, begging for a piece of where are they now? Um, food or so. Where are they now? Yeah. Look, we were children and we took every situation as a fact of life. We couldn't reflect. We couldn't think about a different life. That was our life. The old people had memories, and therefore they suffered many times more than we. In contrast to these conditions, this schoolhouse would become the living quarters for some children who would be largely protected from the horrors of everyday life in Theresienstadt. You remember there were the beds here, the three-story beds? This is where the Birkenau boys first met in their early teenage years, and this is where the bonding began. Hitler would use Theresienstadt for a propaganda film called The Fuhrer Gives a City to the Jews. Scenes were staged to show the Jews having a good time in their ghetto. The reality? Theresienstadt was still a concentration camp. But unlike other camps and ghettos, the children of Theresienstadt were permitted to express themselves through art and music, even putting on plays. But for many, it was a brief delay before the children would join their parents in the Birkenau gas chambers at Auschwitz. But it would be different for the Birkenau boys. The lessons of Theresienstadt would help them survive Auschwitz. When somebody came to Auschwitz, he was taken away from his family. He was alone in a most dangerous situation. He had to be aware of everyone. He couldn't trust to anybody. And because of the past from Theresienstadt, we could create what the Germans so much tried to destroy a life of togetherness.
That spirit of togetherness exists to this very day. They first reunited four years earlier in Israel. But now, together again, the Birkenau boys somehow would find the strength and the courage to retrace their steps back into the very depths of humanity's darkest hour, to the childhood they never knew. We didn't know where we were going, but everybody called it popularly, going east. There is little said as their bus approaches Auschwitz. Their journey to Auschwitz 50 years ago was by cattle car. Suddenly the door, you heard the noise. Raus, ihr dreckigen Juden, hey, you out, you dirty Jews, and aber schnell, schnell, schnell. And the doors open and you had these spots, it was four o'clock in the morning, dark, all the spots on you. And there was, uh, people were shouting, water, water, wasser, wasser, wasser. Now, there would be no shouting, no fear of death, only haunting memories. They have arrived at Auschwitz I, a short distance from the massive Birkenau camp where they had been held and where most of the killing had been carried out. But here, on the grounds of Auschwitz I, through the gate that bears the Nazi lie, work will make you free, the names of many of the victims can be found. Ernie Hacker and his cousin Walter found their family's names on a wall. Here you have my brother. You have my, my father. And you have Walter's. Oh. Oh, my God. 50 years they killed him. No reason for that. Ernie and Walter were extremely close cousins growing up in the same Austrian town. And it was Ernie who stopped Walter from running to his parents' side after children had been separated from their mothers and fathers at Birkenau. And he wanted to go back to them, and I didn't let him go. I said, Walter, you go with me. I don't know what our shiksel, what means, uh, I don't know what our future will be, but you go with me. And he told me then, he says, Ernie, how can you be so mean? I want to go to my mother back. I says, Walter, you go with me. I don't know what will be. I couldn't understand how he could be so cruel to do that to me, you know, to pull me away, to go with him. And uh, my decision to go and not to go was more like he just pulled. And uh, the remembrance was uh, after he pulled in a way, they said, okay, let's go. And if that probably wouldn't have happened, I might have uh, uh, turned back again. And uh, then naturally my faith would have been death. Shortly after, the parents and those children who had stayed by their side were gassed and their bodies burned in the crematoria. I see the flames, I see the crematoriums of Auschwitz burning. I see the people walking in, I see my family walking in. I see them walking in in the crematorium and burning. I see their faces, I see their hands reaching, and I cannot help them. I cannot help them. To this day, I can't believe that I knew what's happening, and I knew what happened, and I wasn't crying. I was not crying to this, even to this day. I, all through the years, even to remember it by, I never cried. They must have taken something away from you, maybe feeling, maybe your mind. I, I, I don't know what it is. Believe it or not, the air is just choking me. It was difficult for many of the Birkenau boys to view Auschwitz as a museum, where spectators can wander through a gas chamber and crematorium and see how the Nazis efficiently murdered hundreds of victims at a time. 
They walked into the gas chamber, believing they were going to shower. Instead, they were gassed. The world learns how the Nazis dehumanized those who were not immediately gassed by shaving their heads and tattooing numbers on their forearms. The numbers would become their names. And 50 years later, those numbers are still visible on the arms of survivors. And here are the shoes that were worn on the little feet of children. Ernie's job in Theresienstadt was to repair shoes for children who were about to be sent east. Human hair is displayed. The hair of female victims sold to be woven into cloth. Tons of hair were discovered by the Russians who liberated Auschwitz. The Nazis even ordered the removal of gold and other precious metals from the teeth of those they murdered. They capitalized on the deaths of their victims. Haunting symbols of lives wasted. The Birkenau boys know all about the deceptions and the atrocities committed at Auschwitz, acts of brutality that defy explanation or understanding. I guess I object to people coming in. Come here. <clears throat> You know, some of these people are like going to a zoo or going to a botanical garden. I just, I just, I guess it bothers me. You know, they're laughing, they're making jokes. For us, it's different. Now, it was time to enter the gate of death at Birkenau and return to the very killing fields that robbed the Birkenau boys of their childhood and their families. The moment approaches when the Birkenau boys will set foot on the very grounds where the ashes of their loved ones lay, somewhere among the birch trees, between barbed wire and guard towers. Fifty years have passed since the angel of death passed over the boys, inside their wooden barracks between the crematoria. Now they have a need to confront it all again. I never wanted to forget. Uh, I wanted to only to know as much as possible, and I wanted to overcome it. Vivid memories for the Birkenau boys are relived as they retrace the horrible nightmare of their youth. The terrible reality of this place can still be felt in the ruins of Birkenau. It's so big, it's, it's, it's uh, overwhelming. I think that's what makes this camp so different than Auschwitz. You know, it was, it was like a, a hoarding place for human cargo. You look at the chimney standing there, it really looks very eerie, doesn't it? The Nazis had blown up the gas chambers and crematoria before fleeing from the approaching Russian forces. But the effort to cover up the atrocities they committed here could never be completed. In the Jewish tradition, special candles are lit in memory of the dead. Here in the ruins of the crematoria, the Birkenau boys remember their loved ones with prayers, memories and tears.
they lived while their loved ones were put in the gas chambers. But when they first arrived here, the Nazis had allowed the families from Theresienstadt to stay together in a so-called family camp, the only one of its kind in Birkenau. Ernie Hacker found the remains of his barracks in the family camp. His job was to carry buckets of human excrement to the latrines. I, when I was working at night, I saw the flames from the crematoriums up to the heavens. All around here are the crematoriums. Yehuda Bakon found the children's barracks at the end of the row. Here and here was my job. I was he, making soup here in this very place. Yeah, my <laughs> chimney. The children would overcome the horror of the crematoria by trying to figure out who or what was burning by the color of the smoke. It was the darkest kind of humor in a totally absurd environment, but it's how children sometimes dealt with death at Birkenau. The flames are like this, the flames are like that, now they're burning fat women, now that was... The, the, yeah. the jokes, you would joke. Okay. I mean, like, you, you would, don't behave. So we joke a lot of smoke. We said, oh, now they uh, burn fat people. Oh, now it's, they burn only paper because they smoke a different kind of colors. As boys, they would be forced to push wagons like this one to carry logs and even old people to the crematoria. Everybody was only leaning on it so he will not fall. Through a hole in the barbed wire separating camps, the Birkenau boys made their way to a wooden barrack still intact. They filed past the long concrete strip that carried heat from the chimney during the chill of winter and also served as a whipping post. So they took us and get us like this. We, we, get, we get over beaten. the beaten like this and they beat us. And here were the stacked wooden shelves that served as beds. Six slept in a row, 18 in one section. I, I remember, for instance, that I slept down next to John Freund. So I know exactly uh, that we were talking every evening, you know. This was the privilege that you, you could talk. I sleep uh, upstairs. What was every it like time. up there? Yeah, I like it. And there Why? was... I mean, <laughs> You, you have not too much choice, no? But why was it better up there? But I, I can have more, more space not to, more breathe. Space. To, to breathe. Many agreed that the upstairs bunks were safer because it was more difficult for the capos, or guards, to make eye contact with the prisoners. Simple eye contact could mean punishment. But on July 6, 1944, Joseph Mengele would enter their barrack to decide who would be next in line for the gas chambers. We're all uh, naked, and uh, he asked a question or two, and uh, pointed right or left, and there was somebody else at the end who wrote those boys' numbers down. The boys that were selected to go to one side wrote their numbers down. Fear, it was uh, more than fear. I don't know how to, you know, how to define it. Uh, terror would probably <laughs> define it better. And. Uh, I, I tried to stay out of his eyesight as far as I could. Everybody, you, know, you didn't want to get into his vision, the uh, field of vision. Uh, stay away from him if you, you know, don't ask for trouble. 89 boys were selected by Mengele to live for reasons still unknown. And when sele Mengele selected us here, we walked to the gate and our parents went after us, after the 90 children, and there was the place in the middle of it, before the gate a little bit, and Walter wanted to run back. And I grabbed him and uh, I told him, Walter, you have to go with me. I don't know what will be, but we are going together. But their parents and brothers and sisters would stay behind. Their fate in the family camp where the bee logger had been sealed. Five days later, they start to liquidate. One night in woman. One mighty man. And they put him and put him all in the gas chambers.
In this living hell for the boys, Helmut Spritzer's talent for whistling would set him apart from the others as a kind of court jester to the Nazis. Yes, it's really, you know, when you see a clown who cries and he laughs. That's the way I was. I was whistling. Uh, inside I felt horrible. Because I was in prison, I didn't know when to get out, and yet I made it. But I was not happy because when I went, went back each night to the barracks, I was always crying. But I didn't show the SS that. They didn't see that. If they would have seen it, I wouldn't have made it. Helmut Spritzer's whistling was his trademark at Theresienstadt, where he was in the band called the Ghetto Swingers, and at Birkenau, where he whistled with the orchestra. I remember his whistling in, uh, in Birkenau. Uh, that was one thing which he saved his life. Helmut grew up in Berlin and studied the behavior of the Hitler youth. He could mimic and impress the SS with his command of the German language. 170, 35, melts you on tour. And you have to put this, uh, that you have to do. Because if you didn't do it, they hit you or anything, you know? So that was, the, the, that, the, way, the, the same way they behaved, they, they wanted their soldiers to behave, I, I behaved that way. And that's the way they respected me. One of his jobs was to stand at the gate at Birkenau when the prisoners marched off to work at six in the morning with the band playing. They came out the barracks and the, the music played over there. Music. Yes, they had a band here, the, the band, the, uh, like a military band, you know. And we have to stay here and when they went through and say, links, rechts, links, rechts, links, rechts. He did chores for the SS, cleaning their motorcycles and boots. They called him Berliner. He just got off the motorcycle, Berliner, Berliner, name us Motorrad. Schnell, eh? And I had to, uh, you know, like a chauffeur, you know, they has to open the door. I went, I went, he didn't always say that when he didn't see me, but automatically when he came, I ran to his motorcycle and he, he, he went off it and he gave it to me, like uh, you give a horse to somebody, you know? And that's, that, uh, I was very quick on the move all the time. See, my boots, uh, that, that's what kept me alive. I was, I knew the, the tension, I knew actually what, uh, the way they were thinking. I was always a bit ahead of them. While most knew him for his whistling, Ernie Hacker remembers Helmet for his acts of kindness. I remember when he came by and whatever he had in his pocket, a piece of bread or a piece of salami that he gave us. And in that time, a piece of bread, uh, there's, uh, you couldn't get it for millions of dollars it was worth. It means life or death. And this kept us a hope that we had somebody at least, a friend, that whenever he could, he tried to help us. Once, Helmut said he approached the angel of death, Dr. Joseph Mengele, asking him to spare the lives of his friends in the family camp from Theresienstadt. I went up to Mengele from all the boys. I was the only one. And I went up to see him and uh, I spoke to him. Only hours later, there would be that famous selection when 89 boys were spared the gas chamber. But many of the Birkenau boys believe Mengele already had a plan to make room for these boys in the so-called punishment block to replace Russian war prisoners who might have posed a threat to the SS. I don't think that would have influenced Mengele. I think that quite likely that uh, Mengele knew there was 100 places in the Menelager and he may have been told, get us 100 people to fill the... That, that makes sense to me. Nobody seems to really know why the selection was made. And if, in fact, it was a matter of filling space someplace, that, that, could, that could be a possible uh, reason. But uh, I, I can't see why they would just fill space, even though it was, it was there, uh, and do quite the opposite of saving lives instead of destroying people. Yeah. I think that's the part that I'm having a problem with. Yeah. One and a half million people were destroyed at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Ninety percent of the victims were Jews. Deep into the Birkenau camp, Helmut and Ernie have located a mass grave site with bones just below the surface. You dig two inches and you find the bones and just look at this grave. Oh. It's whole filled and that's the way they keep it. Look oh, at that. Look at Isn't it unbelievable? A mass grave. Thousands. Who knows? 
Yeah. How deep are those? Three inches. Yeah, look at that. Here they are gone. Nobody comes here. Nobody. Look underneath. Oh, you know. He'll do it for all of them. You never forget them as long as we are alive. Never. Oh. I need to get them. Most of the boys had lived in Czechoslovakia before their world was turned upside down. Though they have returned to a Prague free of Nazi and communist rule, a city celebrating its newfound freedom, their perceptions will always be affected by their experience in the Holocaust. Fifty years ago, many lost those closest to them and had to grow up without their mother's love, their father's guidance, and the companionship of brothers and sisters. So freedom carries a burden for the Birkenau boys. When thoughts run free, they can enter that dark chapter of lost childhood. I was robbed uh, of my childhood. Um, that therefore all of us, knowingly or unknowingly, were different from the rest of the children, that everything, what is from normal or um, just normal, is not for us now. Many have still not overcome the grief losing their parents at an age when they needed them most. It's very difficult to describe to somebody what does it mean not to have two hands, or not to have eyes, or not to have a support from the early childhood. Because for somebody for whom it's just normal to have a daddy and a mommy, and to have somebody in whom you, he can trust, or where he can get support, in whom he can believe, and whom he can take naturally like a part of his self, it's very difficult to explain, but it is one of the most severe um, human condition which can happen to a child. The fact that we are a group and that we could share our sorrows, our feelings, our embarrassments and our disappointments has helped us to overcome a lot of external stress. And it has been a great help for me because, uh, you know, there were six or eight people on, on one bed. So we, we could uh, talk to each other every day and uh, we could share our uh, problems every day and this was very important. We were a group, a bunch of guys, uh, children or what have you. And we kept together very much. We were, we were like, uh, I think, closer than brothers. We faced death. We saw every day, we saw dead people. We were thinking about death as a part of life, which is not normal for young people. A child takes whatever reality he has for granted. That is said. I told you, we couldn't have time for reflection. 
um, to compare it 20 years ago before, because we were just uh, 13, 14 years. That was our life. We were very conscious of it. Um, oh, today they go to the gas chambers, tomorrow we go. But life was something very strange. We saw daily the transports. We, we saw our friends disappear. Unlike most prisoners at Auschwitz-Birkenau, the boys were able to move around the camp. They were among the very few who saw the inside of a gas chamber and crematorium and lived to talk about it. Many of the boys had befriended members of the Sonderkommando, the men who were put on death duty, carrying the corpses out of the gas chamber and preparing them for the crematorium. Uh, I was uh, <laughs> interested, you know, like kids are, you know, like... Uh, and I didn't even know that it was the gas chamber until I went in there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I saw him standing there and I spoke to him and he... he uh, and, uh, uh, the same as here. I saw that all. And he said to me, when the, the gas has uh, started to uh, soften up and the people in 10 minutes test uh, uh, fight, and they open up the doors, you know, then a few bodies fall out already because he told me that the strongest people were always on top and the smallest on the, on the bottom, you know, to press them down. We went to the gas chambers, and again, I looked at it with a special look. I wanted to remember some unconscious um, drive, a tremendous drive. I must remember exactly what it is. I must know how it is. And the children are very curious. It doesn't matter what it is. But they want to know how it, how it works. Because of fantasies before, well, how do they kill the Jews? How do they do it? It's a um, technical interest. They told us they says taking babies, throwing in the air and shooting at them. They told us they take babies and tear them apart. They told us they took babies and threw them uh, on the wall. They told us they look in, in, the, in the gas chambers to see how the people that were gassed crawling on one on top of the other and the strong ones crawling on top to get the air. That's the tracks. And knowing the cruelties of Birkenau, the boys had to watch new arrivals being forced out of those cattle cars and marched off to their deaths. Dogs, dark, yelling, smoke. Duke arrived tired, confused. They were masters at that. Men on one side, women on the other side, and in, in rows of five. And, uh, Some were not lucky, and they marched them to the crematoria directly. And some others, like some of the Czech transports, they were able to they marched them into the family camp. And we knew this night they are liquidating the Czech, the rest of the Czech family camp. And it, it, this very night, when it happened, we knew our parents, our brothers, uh, uh, our mothers, etc., our families, whom we left there, are going to the gas chambers. We suddenly couldn't cry anymore. Though they will carry these memories forever, most of the Birkenau boys have managed to carry on their lives, raising families and entering various professions. But during the period right after the war, normal life seemed absurd to the young survivors. When I saw the first funeral, I thought people are crazy. I saw a funeral with music and uh, uh, horses and people, and uh, I said, are they crazy? For one, for one corp to make such a fuss? Because a week ago or two weeks ago, I, I saw daily burning 10,000 of people. I couldn't understand it. <laughs> Even today, simple things like eating a meal may trigger memories of survival in the camps. A time when food was scarce, and even a single piece of bread was considered a full meal. Harry Goldberger had lost so much weight that he was not recognized by his own mother, who also somehow managed to survive. They met by chance after the war in their hometown. Yeah, I see a woman walking in front of me, and I, 
I recognized my mother and I called out and, and she looked at me and she didn't recognize me. But of course, uh, when I came closer and I talked to her, we... <laughs> I called, Mommy, Mommy. And, and, and she looks, and, and there was a, this look, okay, there was this stranger here. Yeah. Evidently, I changed. She didn't see me for probably two and a half years or what. And, and I, I lost a lot of weight, and, and I was skinny. How skinny? How much did you look? I don't know. I didn't. Go and your mother, how did she look? Um, she, she was didn't look well, but I knew it's my mother. There was no doubt in my mind. <laughs> Concentration camps like Auschwitz-Birkenau have remained open to the public as lasting reminders of the horrors of the Holocaust and as memorials to those who died in them. But some people now are suggesting it's time to move on and close the camps. No, the time is over. It's, it's, uh, the time is over. Forget it. Forget it, huh? Yes, yes, forget it. You shouldn't it. teach the young uh, generation what happened there? Yes, do, do it, please. Because yes. you have now in Germany again anti-Semitism. Because they didn't teach it in school. If they would teach it in school, it wouldn't happen. Just keep talking about it, yes. Yes, but uh, please close the, the concentration camp and plane it again under the earth and, and plant uh, some trees. I want to say that to the whole world, this is wrong. It should never happen again. It should never happen. You should have a lesson from this now, because that's what I'm here. We, we are left, 36 of us in the whole world, the last witnesses. If we are not here anymore, it will be written in books. But it's not the same thing. That's why I come here to tell it. And people should listen. Please listen to us. Listen what we have to say. Listen for your own sake, for your children and the whole world. Listen to the six million which are not here. Please listen. Where are you? Oh, my open Cousins, where are you? Each of the surviving Birkenau boys has had to deal with lost childhood in his own way, searching for his own meaning in life, after witnessing human cruelty beyond imagination. <laughs> Ernie Hacker holds his only grandson, whose middle name is Leo, in memory of Ernie's only brother, who was lost to the gas chamber at Birkenau. I feel that my grand grandchild came exactly 50 years after they guessed my brother. And he's back, and my son gave him his name, my brother's name. And I feel my, my brother came again to me. And I'm very, very happy. Each man will leave behind his own legacy. And each will be a part of the legacy of the group, those who call themselves the Birkenau Boys, selected by fate, some believe, to tell the story 50 years later and the lessons they have learned. Life is a beautiful thing. Uh, I think life is precious, especially what we've been through. This is beautiful. The art of being happy is to be able to accept what you have and not look back and regret what you didn't do or what you could have done. Just take what you have now and be happy with it. Accept it. I think that uh, it's important to come back and uh, sort of reaffirm that uh, we're alive and this reminds you that uh, uh, you came from 
from the depth and uh, you've been able to rise above all of that. I think that's that everybody has got to come away in a positive feeling. Even if it's sad, it's still positive. My wish is that somehow the newer generation will learn something from us and will not repeat the same horrible thing. <laughs>